Well, welcome again. So, second week in our new series called Major on the Minors. How many of you are excited about this series? I am too. I really am. I really am. I'm really excited about this. We started this last week and we called it Major on the Minors and we talked about how we're going to go like one book a week through the Old Testament minor prophets. That's the idea, majoring on the minors, uh, kind of a play on words there. Because we talked about how these are called the minor prophets, but it's not because they're, uh, they have a minor message or that they're just, well, if you ever get around to it, you can check out the minor prophets. They're not really major. They're just... We talked about how dynamite comes in small packages. Remember that? And we talked about how a lot of these books, these minor prophets, what they're really doing is just getting right to the point. And they have a word from the Lord, and they're going to share it with the people that the Lord has put them in to minister to. So we're going to be taking a high-level look at these books together. Some of you have asked me about the order, so you can read ahead. We're just going to go right through the order that they're in in your, in your Bible. So we're going to, we started in Hosea, we're going to end in Malachi. We're just going to work our way right through. There's going to be two weeks in June where I'll be on vacation, where we'll have a couple of other guys fill in the pulpit, and I'm not going to ask them to do these. Uh, so there'll be a little break there, but um, but why are we doing this? We want to increase our biblical literacy as a church. We can always increase our biblical literacy. So that's spending time reading the Word, being together. Uh, I ask you guys to read these in advance to prepare yourselves as well. We want to increase our biblical knowledge, like to understand what are the main themes of these books? What is the message? What is the purpose of these for us today? And that's the last one. How do we find these principles and apply them to our lives today? We can look at some of these messages and think this was a long time ago in a faraway place and not quite understand what does this mean to us. But what I, my goal through this series is to help us understand that these are very relevant for us today. So today we're going to be looking at the book of Joel. Joel, I think is the proper pronunciation, but... I'm just a dude in Lebanon, Oregon, so I'm probably going to say Joel a lot, okay? But no, it's, it's Joel would be the right way to say it. Um, so three chapters, but a lot to say. Three chapters, but a lot to say. So uh, Joel prophesied in the southern kingdom. So we have this picture last week. We saw the divided kingdom. Uh, during that time, Joel was in the southern kingdom. Uh, the north, uh, Israel, uh, made of ten tribes. Judah, the southern kingdom, the tribes of Benjamin, and, and the tribe of Judah. Joel's in the southern kingdom, and the timeline on this one is really, really tough to nail down. There's good arguments both way for about 835 B.C. and good arguments for in the 500s B.C. I'm just deciding to settle with the scholars that say 835 B.C. So it's about 100-ish years before Hosea the book that we looked at last week, okay? So just to give you a frame of reference where we're at. And Joel, one of the things about Joel that's pretty unique is he's one of the first places in Scripture that we see this reference to the day of the Lord, okay? Obadiah also is one of the first references, but they're actually ministering and prophesying right around the same time. So it's hard to know for sure who talks about it first. But, but what we do know about that is that it's a message that the Lord wanted to get out to the people. This idea of the day of the Lord. And that's kind of the, the big theme today. We're going to see this phrase a few times. Uh, it's kind of a spoiler alert for your notes. Um, but that's, that's the idea, that's the main message, that this day of the Lord. So we're going to uncover this pattern and theme as we go through this book together today. So with that, let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you so much for today. And God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that... Um, we can find relevance for us today from the words of a ninth century prophet that, God, you are the same, that you don't change, and that your, your word then that was sent to edify your people is a word that's sent today to edify us. So we thank you for that. And God, I pray that your, your purpose would be accomplished today. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of the things, the first time that we kind of this theme, the present day of the Lord, number one on your notes, the present day of the Lord. So in Joel's time, there was a present day of the Lord. This is how he starts to talk about this. Joel 1, 2, and 3. 
Hear this, you elders. Give ear all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. Okay? Something very significant has happened. Something very significant. This is not just another infestation. This is not just another bad year for the crops, okay? This is an event that no one had ever seen. No one had ever seen an event like this. So what was the event? Locusts. Locusts like no one had ever seen. Lots of them. Joel 1.4, he explains this. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. So these locusts, like no one has ever seen, did a number. They did a number. They brought destruction. So, do you remember 2014 in New Mexico? There was a large swarm of locusts. Anybody remember that? I learned a lot about locusts this week. I did. I did. Here's a couple fun facts. Not all grasshoppers are locusts, but all locusts are grasshoppers. Did you know that? None of you knew that. No. Here's what happens. When grasshoppers, when weather conditions or whatever, when the, the eggs that have been laid don't freeze out or get flooded or die off or whatever, there's like a bumper crop. And grasshoppers don't like to be around other grasshoppers. Did you know that? They're like solitary critters. They're like, just leave me alone. I'm going to be over here eating my grass. Leave me alone. So when there's a huge flock or group born in one year, they get what's called, they become gregarious, okay? And what happens is they're in such close proximity that they start rubbing and running into each other and they get all worked up, you know? It's like, hey, give me my space, give me, you know? So this event right here was one like no one had ever seen. In 2014, I have a radar picture of this swarm of locusts that showed up in New Mexico. Now this was a radar picture. There was so many of them, it was a mile thick a mile high, and that, whatever that big around, okay? The swarm that Joel was talking about was bigger than that. It was bigger than that. Now here, I want to show you a couple pictures because it talks about these different locusts that come through and what they did to the ground. So I have one picture of like during, okay? Like during a locust infestation. So you see they're just like a carpet, right? They're going through and they're eating everything. Now the next one is when they're pretty much done. So that's what gets left behind. You're not doing much with that. We have some farmers here, right? That's not good. That's not good. So the effects of this, when they're left with that, it affects every single part of life. Every single part of life. They can't, they can't make grain offerings because there's no grain. They can't make wine because there's nothing left on the vines. What does that mean to that culture? That means there's no way to worship. The, the cattle have no feed. All the livestock have nothing. They are cut off because of this swarm of locusts from their ability to worship in the prescribed manner. Joel wants to make sure, let's not ever forget this happened because this isn't an accident, and this wasn't just a bad year for the locusts or for the crops. He's saying, I'm insisting that you tell your kids and your grandkids and your grandkids tell their grandkids to another generation that this story doesn't get forgotten. It's a one-of-a-kind event that they experience that they want to make sure is told about. I lived through an event that's a one-in-a-lifetime experience that I tell people about. So if you grew up where I grew up in northern Minnesota, and you say the word megastorm, it will draw, it'll elicit a visceral response from people who were there. It will, okay? Let me take you back. Picture this. 
It's October 31st, 1991. Halloween. 1991. I was 14 years old. So I'm going over to a friend's house, and he wasn't really a friend. He was more of like, an, you know how you have those friends that are, they're kind of friends, but not really, but kind of an acquaintance. So I was 14. My dad's going to give me a ride over to this friend's house. I'm going to be there for the evening. That was it. Keep that part in mind. So I'm going to be there for the evening. As we're walking across the yard to the car, there's snow in the air on October 31st, which was a little early for us, but, you know, it's, it could happen. And so we're walking across the yard, and we're driving over to this guy's house, and it's like starting to snow pretty good. And I thought, wow, this is really something, but, you know, it, it won't stick. The ground's not ready for it, all that stuff. It starts snowing harder and harder and harder and harder. It kept snowing and snowing and snowing. We got 36.9 inches of snow that day and or that night and into the next day <clears throat> the mega storm now here's i have some pictures because some of you all i don't think still understand what i'm talking about when i say what winter is like so this is an extreme example this is one that we tell our kids and they'll tell our grandkids on stuff but where i grew up there's this old thing like oh we had to walk uphill both ways through 10 feet of snow right but not through 10 feet of snow. So, okay, I got some pictures, so let's put the first one up. These are actual pictures from that storm. So that's a car, so that gives you an idea. Okay, now the next one, there's another car. These are important, I'm showing you these pictures of these cars because this comes up in the story in a little bit. Okay, and then here is the next one. This is the scene of a popular road in Duluth where folks are digging out their cars and trying to get them out into the street. So that's a two-lane street, but that's, that's all we got. Okay, I got stuck at that guy's house for three days. <laughs> three days. I had nothing, not even so much as a toothbrush with me. By the end, this is, okay, this will give you an idea. By the end, do you guys remember Sonic the Hedgehog on Saga? Uh, by the time we were done on that third day, I was playing Sonic the Hedgehog with this guy's mom. <laughs> And he was like off doing whatever, because I think we were both just totally like done with each other at this point. <laughs> now, this is how the story ends for me. This is how the Megastorm story ended for me. The guy that lived down the road a little bit, who I also knew, who was also an acquaintance, he had an old, you guys won't even know this, so the Skidoo snowmobiles, the old ones, we called them bubble hoods, okay? It was like a 71 Elon, okay, if that tells you anything. He gets his snowmobile running and he comes over and picks me up. I'm in tennis shoes, jeans, and like maybe a sweatshirt, right? I get on his snowmobile. He drives me back home. You remember those cars poking out of the snow? We drove over a car. <laughs> we drove over a car because you couldn't even tell it was a car there. That was how that story ended for me. I got back home. But Joel was saying that the locust plague that he saw was worse than any other that had ever happened. And we need to tell everyone about it. But there's another aspect to this. There's total devastation. Total devastation. And the event left them, left them cut off from their ability to worship God. It left them cut off from their ability to worship God. Now Joel, in the telling of this, this present day of the Lord, while this is happening, he calls for repentance, and he calls for the people to cry out to the Lord. Joel 1, 13 and 14 says, Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. Because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders, all the inhabitants of the land, to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. Joel just, he really understands because the Lord shows him that this is a message about the plague of the locusts for the people. This is not a coincidence. It's not a bad year. But it serves to illustrate the coming day of the Lord. The coming day of the Lord. That in this event with these locusts, these people firsthand have seen destruction like no one has ever seen. And the Lord is showing Joel, and he's called to tell the people that this is going to happen, that this is coming, this coming day of the Lord. 
Now Joel goes on, and, and scholars divide here again too, whether there's a near day of the Lord that Joel is prophesying about or whether it's only a future day of the Lord. In my reading and in my understanding, there's a near day of the Lord too. That's number two on your notes, and this was specific to Joel's time and place in history, but it illustrates the intensification of his prophecy. So Joel 2, 1 and 2, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been seen before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. So with this imagery of this locust plague fresh in their minds, fresh in the minds of the people, Joel uses this opportunity to say there is something coming that is going to be worse than this. That there will be armies in number like the locusts, how the locusts moved across the landscape, destroying everything in front of them, that there is going to be an army that comes in the same way. This happened. Now I call it the near day of the Lord because it happened either in 722 B.C. in the northern kingdom or in 587 B.C. in the southern kingdom when, when these divided kingdoms were overrun. So what does this have to do with the day of the Lord? Why are we calling it the day of the Lord? Because we see, just a little bit farther down, that God himself is using this army that he's describing to, to execute the judgment on his people that have turned away from him. We see this in Verse 11 of chapter 2. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Now, we're going to explain this a little bit. God is in control of everything. We call this sovereignty. That would be one of the doctrines we would have about God, that he is sovereign. In his sovereignty, he can and does use people and nature to accomplish his will. He's used godless kings and armies before in Scripture to bring judgment on his people that have turned away from him. One of the times that we see this talked about is in Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 8 and 9. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants, and against all these surrounding nations, I will devote them to destruction and make them a horror, a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. Over and over and over, and we're going to hear this theme through all of these minor prophets, God is constantly calling his people back to himself. And another theme that we see in a lot of these minor prophets is that there's a time of judgment. There's a time when a nation is judged for constantly turning away from the Lord. Now, I want to make a side note here that I believe this is a warning for us as well. We aren't special. We are not special. And we, as a nation, cannot continue to turn away from the Lord and not expect a just judgment on the nation. So our job is to pray for our leaders. Our job is to pray that our nation would turn back to the Lord. Our job is to be salt and light in the midst of darkness and decay. Because God's not going to tolerate this forever. But here's the, the, the beautiful part of this. This strong word, this strong prophetic word, is that even as the army is advancing, God is still open to repentance. In fact, he desires it. Joel 2, 12 through 14, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. 
and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Look at this. As the army is advancing on the nation, the people that have turned away from them, he is still saying, you can turn in repentance. You can be saved from this judgment that is coming. Return to me with all your heart. More and more evidence that it's always been about the heart. It's always been about the heart. What he doesn't say here is, hey, crank up the, the ceremonial system of sacrifice and worship. Make things look good. Get it going again. He doesn't say, if you can make everything look good, I will relent on this judgment. He says the exact opposite. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Now, rend is just a simple word that means tear open. That's what rend means. Tear open your hearts, not your garments. So we're all familiar in the Old Testament, the idea of he tore his clothes. We've heard that. That sign of guilt or shame, uh, sorrow, right? He tore his clothes. You've all heard that. And it's this big symbol uh, that people would use to show how grieving they were. They would tear their clothes. God is saying here, tear your heart. Tear your heart. What does that mean? That means do the work on the inside, not on the outside. It's, it's God saying, I am more concerned about a genuine repentance than outward signs of repentance. It's God saying, give me the real thing. So that's a good word for all of us to consider. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. Are you focusing on the way things look in your life? Are you trying to make sure everything looks right? Are you trying to look like a Christian? Or are you trying to be a Christian through a heart that is torn open for the Lord? This exact self-examination is what Joel wants. Joel is calling for the people then and the people today to examine. Am I rending my heart to the Lord or am I merely rending my garment to the Lord? So after this, Joel paints this picture of of people restored through genuine repentance, through rending their heart, there's a restoration that comes. And it's this beautiful picture of provision. They get new wine and new oil. There's peace. He drives the enemy far from them. He restores the land by restoring the pastures for the animal. In a sense, what he's doing there is he's making a way for them to be able to worship in the way that was prescribed to them. So that restoration opens up the opportunity for them to worship and have relationship the way that it was prescribed in that system. He also gives them something to look forward to. Joel 2:28 and 29, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, even on the male and female servants. In those days I will pour out my Spirit. A coming time when God himself will dwell among his people through his spirit. Regardless of age, race, sex, economic status, it doesn't matter. That God is going to come through his Holy Spirit and dwell with people. This message is universal, but it is exclusive to those who would respond. It's universal in its application, but it's exclusive to those who respond. Joel 2.32 is another wonderful verse that we see quoted elsewhere in Scripture. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape 
as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Beautiful picture of this ability, this ability for us to respond to the call of the Lord. For us to respond to the prophet's call for repentance. Beautiful picture for us. Now this intensification that we see from the near day, or the present day of the Lord to the near day of the Lord, now we see it intensified even to the future day of the Lord. Joel chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land. And have cast lots for my people, and have traded a boy for a prostitute, and have sold a girl for wine, and have drunk it. The future day of the Lord. The future day of the Lord. This is what still lies ahead. This is one reason and one part of why there is still great relevance for us today here. I just want to say it this way. Joel was not wrong about the present day of the Lord and the locusts. Joel was not wrong about the two kingdoms that would come against the divided kingdom in these invading armies in the near day of the Lord. And he's not wrong about the future day of the Lord either. This is coming. This will happen. Depending on your eschatological position, You might have different ideas about when this will happen and whether the church will be exposed to it or be part of it. I talked about this in detail on a video uh, message, I think two summers ago. So you can uh, go to our YouTube channel and you can look for that video. I think it's just called The Rapture. Um, You can go check that one out. We're not going to spend time on that now because that's not what's important here. But you can find it. It's out there. Uh, But regardless of where you land on that issue, there are a few things to point out about the future day of the Lord. So we see in chapter 3, verse 10, I want to look there for a second, because there's a really powerful thing. Joel 3.10 says, Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a warrior. Now, Scripture is... Amazing. And the more and more that we go into God's Word, the more and more that it edifies us, and the more and more that it humbles us, and the more and more it communicates to us the truth that this is the inspired Word of God. That 66 books written by 40 authors over 1,500 plus years has one continuing message the redemptive story of Jesus, but it also helps us have confidence in that. Because the Holy Spirit, through another prophet, gave us kind of a glimpse to the other side of this future day of the Lord. He shows us what the future looks like for those who have responded in that call for repentance. He shows us what it looks like for those who have rent their heart to the Lord and have submitted to God and accepted the free gift of salvation. This is so cool. Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 4 says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. And all the nations shall flow to it, and many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Do you see how that's the opposite? It's a picture of peace. It's a picture of peace. A picture where the Lord is ruling and reigning and instructing. And the plowshares that were beaten into swords 
or return to plowshares. And the pruning hooks that were beat into spears are returned to pruning hooks. Why? Why? Because the war is over for good. It's over. Spoiler alert, Jesus wins. <laughs> Spoiler alert, Jesus wins. Because again, depending on your eschatological view, you may or not, may not be here for it. Okay? So I'm just going to let you know how it ends. Jesus wins. But what we learn from Joel is that we're not going to have peace on earth until that happens. We're not. Yes, we pray for peace. Yes, we pray for wars to end and for lives to be spared. But we know that there will only be war until that time. Not only will there be war, but that the war will intensify. Jesus said that. Matthew 24, 6 through 8. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginnings of the birth pains. There is a view of some folks that were a good people and a good world getting better. And that doesn't jive with Scripture or with our own personal experience. That this not only is going to be our situation until Jesus comes back and finishes it, but it's going to intensify. We need to know that. We need to know that and not be caught off guard. But there's so much apocalyptic imagery in the book of Joel that's reinforced in the book of Revelation. Now just one example, Revelation 9, 3 through 4. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So the locusts come back, but this time they're not eating grass and plants. And they're sent to torment the people who have not responded to that call. But what's the point? What's the purpose of this? What does Joel want the reader, that's us, what does Joel want the reader to know? He wants us to know what has happened shows what is coming. He's telling his people, what has happened shows what is coming, and there's an intensification of these events leading up to the future day of the Lord. So, a few takeaways, but one of them is simply this. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. There's a time coming where there will be a judgment, and all those who don't know the Lord will experience it. It'll be like nothing we have ever seen. It will be like nothing that will ever happen after it. It will be once and for all and final. So think of it this way. Joel used the locusts to warn folks about the coming foreign invasion. And then he uses the foreign invasion to warn them about the future day of the Lord. And in those warnings, he builds in these opportunities and these options for any to turn and repent and to come back to the Lord and to experience the blessing and the restoration and the, the relationship that's available. When we do that, the Lord restores us. He's using this imagery to show the coming judgment of earth. Joel uses strong imagery that in Scripture portrays judgment over and over. Joel 3.13, Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vat overflows, for their evil is great. This is imagery of judgment. That's what this is. Evil will be judged. We know that all of us, apart from the Lord, stand in this judgment for sin. The scripture tells us that we were enemies of God in our sin. But the beautiful thing is that we have a choice 
Joel 3.14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. This is that picture of all the nations coming in this valley of decision, and each one of us stands in that valley of decision. We all decide. As the army is approaching, we can still decide. Do we turn away from that sin that makes us enemies of God? That will be judged by Him? Or do we rend our hearts, not our garments, do we rend our hearts to God? Do we look to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that paid the penalty for the sin that makes us God's enemy and that has us standing squarely in that judgment that is hell? Future day of the Lord, that's the judgment. The judgment is eternal torment in a place called hell. What Joel's saying and what I'm saying is there's a decision to be made. There's a decision to be made. The future for those who decide to turn back to God is where Joel finishes. We see the future. He's telling us about what's going to happen after that. Verses 18 to 21, And in that day the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water, and a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, and the water, and water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall become a desolation, and Edom a desolate wilderness, for the violence done to the people of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall be inhabited forever, and Jer Jerusalem to all generations. I will avenge their blood. Blood I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. A powerful image for us. A powerful image for anyone that reads this book of Joel. The aftermath of the future day of the Lord. Where there's peace and blessing for those who know the Lord, and desolation and judgment for those who don't. What do I mean when I say future? Future day of the Lord. I don't know. I don't know what I mean when I say future. But it will happen. It will happen. That's what I know. Jesus said, no one knows when. But it will happen. So, we need to be ready. What do we do? We need to be ready. First, we need to decide. If you haven't decided, today's a great day to decide. Do you understand that? Today's a great day to decide. We need to help those who God has put around us to decide as well. Just as Joel tried to do with the nation that God had him in, we should not only be motivated to be sure of our decision and that our heart is inclined and rend to the Lord, but to share the good news of the Lord with those around us because this judgment will happen. There's no other way to say it. We need to know that this is telling us what is going to happen and we need to take that seriously. And it should cause us to have a sense of urgency, not only to be sure of our salvation in Christ, but it should light our fires to share that good news with those who don't know him. Because we've already looked into the future and we see what happens. Now, there's a beautiful thing that those of us who have made that decision get to do. And we're going to do that together today. We get to celebrate, Corinthians tells us, we celebrate the Lord's death until he returns when we do this. When we go to the communion table together, we remember the sacrifice that gives us the ability to share in that picture of the future where there's no war, where there's no peace, where there's no no conflict, where there is only peace, where there is no pain, no sorrow, all of those things are open to us because of what we celebrate at the Lord's table. This is for each one that turns from their sin in repentance and accepts that free gift of salvation is enjoying and celebrating the promise of eternity spent with Jesus. 
moving out of the place of impending judgment. The armies are coming over the hills and over the walls, and we can turn away. So what does that mean for you? I'm too far gone. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've looked at. You don't know what I've said. You don't know what I've ingested. I don't care. I don't care. And neither does the Lord. Because you can come to him and you can confess that and you can say, I understand that this is the sin that separated me from you. And I see the impending judgment and I rend my heart to you. And I'm turning away from all this stuff and I'm turning towards you. And I don't know what that looks like, but I know I need to do it. That's what's available today and that's what we celebrate. 